Good morning. So today, uh, what are we talking about? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Sassy here. Is anyone there? Hi, my name is Sassy. I'm based in Berlin and I want to welcome you to Sisi, the podcast where you see what others see. In this, our first season, we're talking about colors. Today I'm here in Berlin with a little bit of a cold and my delighting co-host Petra van Phelen. Good morning, Petra. How are you? Hi, Sissy. I'm very excited about getting started today. Our guest today is Ana Elena Malet from Mexico. She's an independent curator specialized in modern and contemporary design. She's a professor at the Tecnológico de Monterrey at the School of Architecture, Art and Design. Besides, she is researcher, historian, author, and one of the most important reference and cultural promoters for Latin American and especially Mexican design. She has worked as consultant, advisor, deputy director and head of preservation in some of the most important cultural spaces in Mexico, like the MUAC, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Museo Tamayo Arte Contemporaneo, Museo Sumaya, Casa del Lago and Museo del Objeto del Objeto, to name a few. And the list goes on and on. At international level, she is a member of the New York MoMA Architecture and Design Acquisitions Committee and has collaborated with museums such as the Art Institute of Chicago and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Welcome, Annalena. Good morning to you in Mexico, and thank you very much for being here. It is a real honor. Thank you, Ceci. Thank you, Petra. It's a pleasure. Well, then let's get started. Annalena, I wanted to ask you, you see your career and how it developed I have to say that I see you a little bit as a minstrel, a storyteller of modern times, in the sense that through the objects you curate and exhibit, you tell us little stories that are interwoven and that piece by piece give sense to a bigger story, perhaps that of explaining our own existence. And your role does not end there. You subsequently leave the minstrel aside to document or record these findings in books of design of the 20th century. I want to ask you, how did you mature into all of these roles? And could you tell us a little bit about your story and the development of your career? I love when you say you see me as a storyteller because I think that's part of what I want to do and I've been doing. I started working in, I'm an art historian, started working in museums and realized that in Mexico, there was not a design museum. And I thought, I love, I love design. And I thought design was a very important cultural practice that should be reviewed, revised and documented uh, within the museums. And that was not happening. So I started kind of a, a quest, a crusade to try to get the art museums in Mexico to deal with uh, design contents. That started because I wanted to work with contemporary designers, but on working with them, I realized that we needed more context. We needed to know what had happened before them and, and where they were heading. And the only way to do that was trying to construct or, or research, investigate history of design in Mexico and understanding what was that path of the history of design in Mexico. So that's uh, how I got involved with working with Clara Porcet's archive, this Cuban-Mexican designer that arrived in Mexico in the 30s, and she formed her profession and her career in Mexico, trying to develop um, a, a project of Mexican design just after the revolution. So so that's been part of my path now, uh, Happily, I can tell you that three weeks ago we opened um, an exhibition that it's called Modernis Handmade Modernism in Mexico that talks about this other history of Mexican design, the, the handmade, not only the industrial. And with, with that, we started the first public collection of design in Mexico in a university museum, the National um, the National University, now it's uh, betting, supporting, 
a, a project to create um, a, a, dis a public design collection to tell the story about the authors, objects, and stories that that had passed in Mexico, that uh, had happened in Mexico in the 20th century. So that was part of my interest to tell these stories, these different stories from different different point of views about the objects, the authors, the situations, and the, the development itself of material culture in Mexico. Thank you, Ana Elena. That sounds very impressive and inspiring. And also, uh, I hear a lot of passion um, when you're telling this. And in addition to that, um, I would like to ask you, as I learned about your career and your projects, I noticed a great sense of pride in being Mexican and in Mexico's rich uh, cultural tradition. In a way, you have become an ambassador for Mexican design, which is very important because worldwide, there's not so much reference to it. And do you see yourself as an advocate and promoter for Mexican art and design abroad? And in addition, I would like to ask, what would be essentially important in Mexican art and design that should be shown to the rest of the world? At the beginning, I didn't say I didn't see myself as a as an advocate. Now I believe I am, and I have kind of earned the right because I've been working for the last a bit more than 20 years, and I know what I'm talking about. I've done a lot of research, and also I have the trust and confidence of Mexican designers and, and the son of the, the the children of Mexican designers that had work here. So. I do see myself now as an advocate and, and what I want to transmit to the world is the importance and the originality of Mexican design. In terms of what should be communicated or shown of Mexican art and design, I do think it's a very unique uh, product, the art and design we made in Mexico. We have a very unique history related, yes, to war, but to mestizaje, no, uh, two races, two countries coming together and creating kind of a third nation, a third project that is now our Mexican project that comes from a pre-Columbian past, uh, the, Spanish, uh, the Spanish encounter, uh, and that that we are creating now. We are a melting pot of many, many different races, ways of thinking, way of, ways of doing things, because it's not only the pre-Columbian and the and the Spanish, but also um, a good number of exiles or, or emigres that had been here uh, during the 20th century and early 21. Migration has been a very important factor in developing design in Mexico. And I think that melting pot, that different points of view, but all of them related to the importance of the territory or of the geographical condition of the light we have in Mexico, of the rich heritage, cultural heritage, the importance of tradition, uh, it makes Mexican production quite unique. Okay, uh, so let's talk about this plurality and colors now. For the rest of the world, Mexico is known as a country of colors. <laughs> Folk art to architecture, food, painting, contemporary art and design, you name it. Color is part of Mexican national identity. You curated an exhibit in 2019 in Mexico City, Mexico a Color, Mexico in Color, for the Museo del Objeto, where the Besmagord method was mentioned. And this was very exciting to learn about. Could you tell us a little bit about this method and how after the revolution, the course of Mexican identity changed regarding color perception? I don't think we need a lot of uh, discussion about color. Uh, I mean, the, the thing that distinguishes Mexican color is light. Uh, we're in different uh, situation than Europe. We have, we don't have the, the, the seasons of the, of the year as marked as you have in Europe. We don't have a long winter with very few light. Uh, we, we, we do have amazing, uh, amazing sun and amazing light all year round. And that makes you know, the, the colors look different than in other parts of the world. You know, that, that's a fact. And, and we don't have to, to, to be, be very theoretical about it. You no, know? we have amazing light. Um, 
we don't have an extended winter. We have amazing climate conditions, and that makes the colors really bright and beautiful in Mexico. So that's a fact, and that's something that Mexican painters and artists have take advantage of. Um, Método Besmogar, uh, it's a method that Adolfo Besmogar, a painter, in the early 20th century, in the early 20s, 20th century, 1923 to be exact, it's a, a design method, a, a drawing method that he created based on patterns and references of a Mexican folk art and antique art in the world. He got like the uh, straight line, the zigzag line, like different lines that combined could create a kind of universal alphabet to create patterns and communicate with all of the world. That drawing method was taught at schools, at public schools in Mexico for a brief period of time, I think like from 23 to 28. Uh, but it was really impressive because you, you did not need to learn how to read. But with that, uh, with that system, uh, children could learn how to draw and communicate a feeling, uh, a moment, uh, a, a character, with all those six elements that he you know, detected and he created and put up in his in his system, in his Método Besmogar. Uh, that was not very much related. It was Método Besmogar more related to patterns you know, and, and, and references, not really to color, but it worked perfectly well with color. You no know? Referencing the Besmogar signs with bright Mexican colors really created a new kind of vocabulary. For many of the painters, uh, uh, professional and, and amateurs uh, of, the, uh, of the period after the revolution, and that helped to shape a lot what we were trying to communicate after the revolution. There was this national project to create a national identity. You now, the revolution was a civil war, the North fighting against the South, against the East. So we needed to create a national identity that could uh, identify us all. So that project was an artistic project, a cultural project in which signs, colors, reference um, it could help us really identify with one another and, and to create a, a whole a, a, a same identity that we could all identify with the same things. So, so Método Besmogar was part of that uh, narrative, of that, that very uh, important project after the revolution that even up to today we keep on questioning and utilizing in some way. Okay, so you would say that Mexican colorfulness identity somehow came from a marriage between a natural process, let's say like a uh, palette, vivid palette from the pre-Hispanic uh, world, uh, where there was, of course, a great amount of pigments and dyes available. And with uh, this marriage with an almost an artificially architectured project. Exactly. Yes, I think we have, uh, you got it right. We have both parts, no? really trying to discover What was Mexico about? What were our references? We needed to have some history to, to push back and to project to the future as well. And, and we had a, a construction that was done after the revolution, constructing Mexican identity. But we also had an amazing natural patrimony, uh, flowers, uh, animals, uh, pyramid, architect, pre-Columbian architecture, And as you mentioned, I think the natural dyes that was a very important heritage from the pre-Hispanic years uh, was something very important at the moment because natural dyes were used not only in textiles, but also in clay, in, in, in most of the arte popular, the folk art uh, and, and traditional art, uh, uh, natural dyes were part of, of a discourse, of a creation of a narrative. Thank you, Anna. In addition to that, <clears throat> I would like to ask you, every country or culture can be associated with typical, let's call it, visual characteristics. 
For example, a Scandinavian design looks very natural with soft and natural materials and colors. African countries have a very colorful appearance. White colors can be associated with the Middle East. And as Ceci mentioned before, we know Mexico as a country of an eclectic mix of bright colors. Um, do you think the daily use of bright, strong colors is still more present in a Mexican household than, for example, in a German household? And what do colors reflect in people's daily life, in products and fashion and art regarding Mexican design? Do they have a meaning? I do think color has a meaning, a different meaning in different times. Uh, I do think in Mexico, we are not scared, not afraid of using bright colors. I think it's part of our identity and it's part of creating shiny uh, everyday spaces. Uh, I mean, just recently, these past few weeks, we had this discussion in the, in the city. Uh, one of the majors of the big boroughs in Mexico, in Mexico City, decided to erase the, the urban graphics that accompany the taco stalls in the streets. Uh, in Mexico, every taco stall we have in the street, they have like urban drawings made by the, the seller himself or the seller himself hires someone to present tacos, torta, all the fantastic Mexican food. Well, this, this, uh, major, this major decided to erase everything in order to put order and progress. Eh? talking about a fascist thing. And she raised the colors of the city. So we have a big discussion now because we feel, even if I'm not an owner of a taco stall or a torta stall, it was part of my identity and part of what it gave meaning to my, my borough, to my neighborhood. Uh, so so we, we, it's part of our identity, of our Id idiosyncrasy, uh, we we are not afraid of using color. We are not afraid of uh, not uh, letting color get into our dress, into our dress codes, into our homes. Uh, I think uh, there's a visual education that relates to bright colors, even if they don't combine one with each other. No, we we try to create these new languages regarding the mix of colors. And it's, it, it's a very important part of who we are and what we want to communicate. And Elena, you were talking about delicious food right now. And um, I wanted to say that something that I really like about the exhibits that you curate is that you recognize all the components of design in your exhibitions. Um, Rethink Tradition, Contemporary Design from Mexico is one of these exhibitions. It opened in Washington, D.C. in 2010. And in this exhibit, um, you show the continuing changing force of Mexico City by the contemporary designs. And, and here they were integrated, of course, different sorts of elements. You had history, you had economy, you have environment, and also, of course, the social element. Everything was there. Um, these objects display a yearn for the future reflected in the modern touches. But also there is always a sort of wistfulness to the past, rebuilt, as you before said, the implementation of traditional methods of Mexican handicrafts. Regarding the purpose of color, is there also a degree of nostalgia, but also a desire to the new through the application of new color shades? Do you see a reinterpretation of color in the future of Mexican contemporary art? Yes, completely. I do think there's a bit of nostalgia, uh, but a nostalgia also that keeps on uh, evolving. A nostalgia, nostalgia can become like uh, the desire of a future. And I want to, to set an example that it's the Rosa Mexicano, the Mexican pink. Uh, we have this amazing character that is Ramon Valdeosera, one of the first fashion designers in Mexico. And he actually was the creator, the inventor of the Mexican pink. Not because he mixed you know, the ingredients to create that bright bougainvillea or fuchsia color, but because in, in 47, 1947, he went to New York and present a collection that was all that color, that bougainvillea or that uh, fuchsia, fuchsia color. 
When somebody asks, why, why do you have that color? What does it mean? So he said, in Mexico, the vernacular architecture, the candies, the traditional textiles, all of them are this color. I don't know why, but it's this color. So, so the journalist answered, ah, so it's a Mexican pink. <laughs> so the shocking pink uh, that, uh, that was at, at the moment, uh, Stef- uh, uh, Stefarelli, Stefarelli uh, had like brought to the table, then changed the perception. It was like the same tone, uh, the same color, but it just you know, had a different meaning. No, uh, a different meaning now was related to Mexico. And if you think of Luis Barragan architecture, it's a Mexican pink. And if you think of Roberto uh, Ricardo Legorreta architecture, it's a Mexican pink. Uh, so, so I do think we have different meanings for for diff- We have meanings for the same colors in different periods of time. And in Mexico, uh, it also relates to the past, but also to 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 constructing a future that it's bright and colorful. Thank you, uh, Annalena. I would like to ask something about a recurring event in um, your culture. There is uh, the f- one festivity in Mexico that I think uh, captures the attention of the European spectator. And that is the Day of the Death the sec- on the 2nd of November, where people create almost art pieces as they build altars for their deaths. This is a very colorful festivity, and normally you would associate uh, normally you would associate colors uh, with joy. Um, now the question that pops up regarding regarding this tradition is: Are the Mexicans intrinsic happy people? They have like they breathe the joy. I do believe we are happy people. We are always on the quest for hope. Even if our political situation is dreadful, even if we are going through earthquakes of poverty, there's always this glimpse of a brighter, better future. And that relates, as I was saying, to the light we have and also the, the fantastic and diverse nature. So we have amazing fruits with amazing colors, flowers, uh, no, our flora in the in the country, uh, natural heritage is really amazing, and that gives us something to to hope for. No, and and you were talking about Day of the Dead altars, and that uh, it's created artificially, but also we share with our dead, uh, with our no closer dead, uh, fruits, vegetables, things they like, natural things they like. While we were while they were on earth. So so it's both the artificially created with you no know, paper pieces, you no, know, and 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 cut you no know, and cardboard cuttings and everything that we do to present the altars, but also with the natural materials, the food, uh, the vegetables, the, the the things we share on the table. And that's an essential part of color in our table and in our, our everyday life. A totally different question. We have some time uh, uh, left for more questions. Um, if you could curate an exhibition about color in art and design and architecture focused on another country or col- culture in the world that fascinates you, which country or culture would that be and why? I think it would be the UK. I lived there for a while. And what I miss the most about Mexico while I lived there was color. The UK is essentially gray because they have a very, very, very long winter and most of the time is gray. So the light is gray, no? The, the, so the change, the, the change of color is from the summer to the long winter, it's very evident and very, you know, and, and very nostalgic in a way. So I would, I would uh, very much like to to research that also because you have an amazing countryside really cor- color the green is really colorful when summer arrives and i think that no it, it's not only a perception but also also has to do with with climate condition and geographical and i think sometimes we forget that color has to do also with the natural and geographical and climate conditions and that that shapes our 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 view in a way. I have another question that's about um, 
the curating, the art of curating, actually. It seems like, um, yeah, creating an exhibition is like art in itself. And um, you decide on the concept, the message you want to uh, give the public and the space configuration. And I can imagine it is a very delicate process and certainly very different in each country. What could you say would be the main differences in preparing an exhibit in Mexico or in the US or in Europe? I mean, in Mexico, we never have time and we never have money. So we have, <laughs> so we have to find... We know this. <laughs> so we have to find many resources to, to, to make it work, no? For example, me working in the States, sometimes in the United States, sometimes we have four years to do research, to really think over what you're trying to say, to do a, you know, an amazing research. Sometimes you have money to travel and, 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 and get material. And, and in Mexico, I mean, we always talk about like the, the three, we call it the law of three. You have three days, three weeks, and three months to develop absolutely everything, <laughs> no? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we have to find other resources. We have to be creative, no? To, to work also in the, in the non-formal, non, non-formal methods that we have in Mexico. So, so just that. In Mexico, we have to be very resourceful, to, to be very creative, to be very focused because sometimes we don't have a lot of time and, and economical resources. Uh, but we have amazing materials to work with, no? All from the national to the international. Uh, Mexico has been a very cosmo- cosmopolitan country. So we have, we find amazing he- stories that relate to different parts of the world. And different idiosyncrasies. So, so I think I'm very lucky to to work here and live here. And Elena, you, as I've said before, you take design beyond the object, literally, by bringing all senses into play. You add food, music, etc., to these exhibits. In this sense, what role do color play in museography? You know that um, I just realized recently that has that the that. Is very important, and I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you the story. I most of my exhibitions had been white, no, a white cube. Not because I'm in love with the white cube, because most of the time I never have a budget to buy color painting, no, <laughs> and neither I have the time to experiment um, which color goes with what, or to do all this colorimetry that I would love to do with uh, with exhibitions. Uh, but a couple of years ago, there's this big color company, a painting company in Mexico that has developed a, a lab research specializing in Mexican color. And he started inviting Mexican professionals, designers, architects to create the trends for Mexican color. No, Mexican created for... Uh, For Mexicans, so not, not really following the color trends of other parts of the world, but creating it within in their own lab. So they invited me, and I, I really didn't want to go because I said, like, I mean, I'm not an architect. I don't use color in my walls because I never have the money. So they kind of taught me not to be afraid of color, to really try. They have a couple of apps and a whole process of on of understanding color that really changed my perception. Now, color is a very important part of the work I do. Uh, I try not to not not to use much color because most of the objects I do I use in the exhibitions, I mean, they speak of color themselves. Uh, but I think we have to have a you no know, a couple of walls. Uh, that add color, that help to tell the story better, that help the, the audience to navigate around the, the museum galleries. So I do think color is very important uh, to, to address the story, the narrative you want to tell in a museum or in an, in an art space. So, and Elena, to finish our interview, we want to ask you to please answer a question that's, that was made specially for you. 
by an Israeli hyper-realistic painter that lives here in Berlin. His name is Abnon David Ar, and he asks you, Do you think that colors, specific colors, like blue, would have a different absolute or, or a different, um, either blue or red or yellow, any one of these colors would have the same meaning to all people. And I will give a little bit of an example. When we say red, we all think of spicy, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, if do you think it's a cultural thing or do you think it's something that is inherent in all humans? Is it objective? Are, is our, the way that we refer to colors emotionally something universal? That's the question. I think we have a little bit of the three of them. Because when you said red, you think of spicy. I don't think of spicy because spicy is in my culture. So for me, spicy could be peppermint green. For me, spicy could be chile manzano, that it's yellow. And also chile, that could be red. If you think of red, I could think of blood because of the situation we're living in Mexico. But I could also think... Uh, of uh, amapolas or uh, amaranto, amazing Mexican flower. So I think a little bit of the three of that you mentioned, no uh, idiosyncrasy, culture, something that we learn and that has influences, influenced us. Uh, at the end, tradition as learning is not static. It keeps on developing and we are learning and our visual culture, our visual impacts keep on growing uh, as, uh, while we travel, what we learn, what we see things, what we subjected to, to visual stimulus. So I think we have a bit of it, a, a little bit of the three of those. Anna Elena, thank you so much. This has been a superb interview. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and for having also given us your time. No, thank you. It was a pleasure. I, I, I really feel proud that you research my, my career and that I could add something to this incredible podcast that you do. I hope to see you in Mexico soon, though. Yeah, or we hope to see <laughs> you yeah. in Berlin soon, yeah. too. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you, Anna Elena. It was really a joy uh, listening to your very interesting and inspiring stories. And thank you, Ceci. Uh, please be sure to check this chapter's description to find information about Anna Elena Mallet's bibliography and coming exhibits curated by her. Thank you, Petra, and thank you to our listeners, wherever you are, for having allowed us to share time with you. We will see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>